For the next two weeks, I am going to preach the entire Bible. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> That's impossible. Challenge accepted. Yeah, I didn't say each Wednesday, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to walk through the story of the Bible in the next two weeks. And the idea kind of came because we've just went through Easter, uh, where we celebrated uh, Good Friday, Jesus um, giving his life on the cross for us, dying for us, coming into Easter, him rising from the dead, that celebration, and then, okay, well, okay, now what then? <laughs> like, so what? Like, is that weekend just gone? Or do we, does that kind of affect the rest of our lives or the rest of their years? And so I was thinking about it, and I, I think God kind of put this on my heart. Well, why not? Let's tell the whole story. And we'll start right from the beginning. So guess where we're starting? No! <laughs> we're starting from John. Chapter 1. Yes. And we know this is the beginning because it opens with in the beginning. All right. This is the Gospel of John. We're going to read just five verses. It's going to be up behind me on the screen. And uh, this is this scripture, like if you, yeah, if you have time later, just read the whole chapter. It is the most fabulous chapter ever. It is so amazing. Just as a literary work alone, it's incredible. But what it says is unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. And so let's, let's just get into the first five verses. So now I'm getting excited, right? All right, John chapter one. In the beginning was the word. Why is the word capitalized there? Is he talking about words? No, what is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about the Bible. Okay, God, more specifically? Jesus. Okay? The word is Jesus. And so it's interesting that John is beginning his gospel. Gospel means good news, by the way with this statement. In the beginning was the word. It's capitalized because the word is a person. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Is that not a confusing statement? Amazingly written, though. The word was with God. And the word, Jesus, was God. He was with God in the beginning. John is establishing something very important here. That Jesus was not part of God's creation but Jesus is God. Through him, all things were made. Through who? Through Jesus. So Jesus was present at creation. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Pretty obvious statement, right? If he's made everything, and if he was there from the beginning, then nothing has been made that has been made without him. All right, here we go. In him was life. That sounds pretty good. And that life was the light, and that's, our, that's gonna be our, our key word. In him, oh, sorry. It, and that life was the light of all mankind. How much of mankind? All, all. that's everyone, right? And this is maybe, and I've said this many times, this is one of my favorite verses. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so we are going to tell the story of the Bible. And we're going to answer these questions. Who is the light? And where did the darkness come from that the light needs to push it back? And why is the word considered to be the light? So we're going to answer those questions today. All right, so let's get into it. A little uh, kind of setup for us as we, as we head into this story few things that we need to understand about the Bible. Number one is that the Bible is not just a whole bunch of unrelated stories. Okay, we call them books of the Bible, right? There's 66 books in here. So the word Bible actually means library. It's actually a library of separate 
works by, I think it's over 40 different authors. However, what's really important to understand, and over like a thousand year period, or actually more than that, it was written. It's just unbelievable. It's like, wow, all of these authors over all this time in three different languages, and we have what's called, what we call today, the Holy Bible. It's pretty incredible because here's what the most amazing part of it is, that all of these authors, all of these books tell one big underlying story. Now that is amazing. This span over 3,000 years of writing in different languages, different cultures, it's like, what? Yeah. It's incredible. How in the world can they all tell just one story? Well, this one story is this one big story that is in play is seen in every small story. So every individual story throughout the Bible is all pointing to this one big story. And the big story of the Bible is about this. It's about God, creation or humanity, and his desire to be with them. The entire story of, of Scripture or the Bible is about God desiring to be with his creation, to be with his people. And so we're going to talk about, and by the way, we're talking about John chapter 1, the light and the darkness. Well, it's about God pushing away the darkness so that the light can shine, so that we can have, be in relationship with God. So in this story, there is one hero. Right? We like to talk, in fact, we had a series just like, a year and a half ago called Heroes. And it's, it's fun kind of to, to look at these biblical characters and biblical stories. But ultimately, there's actually only one hero in this, in this book. And it's, this hero is, uh, it, he plans an amazing rescue mission for his most beloved or loved creation, humanity. So that's what the Bible is about. It's about God revealing himself, who he is, his character, through this story about him and his creation, and more specifically, humanity, and how God is going to repair what's gone wrong, and that it's all born out of this deep desire to be in relationship with people because he loves people, his creation. So the big story reveals to us a God who deeply loves people and will do the unthinkable to rescue them. And here's the unthinkable. That God would become part of his creation. Like this is, this is the God of the universe, fills the universe. And somehow he's going to limit himself and become part of his creation and sacrifice himself to save the ones he loves the most. That's the storyline. That's the big storyline that we're going to dig into. All right. You guys ready to get into the story? Do you guys think I can do this in that short of time? <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. All right, let's go. We got to, yeah, we, we're going to have to cruise to this story. And so for my PowerPoint person, uh, as we kind of keep track of time and how far and how fast we're going, I may be skipping a little bit. So uh, hold on, let's go. So, the Bible has two beginnings. They both start the same. They both start in the beginning. And so we're going to the second in the beginning, which chronologically was the first. <laughs> and here we go. In the beginning, God creates the earth, the heavens and the earth, and everything in it was good. This is, I, oh, I, I should kind of explain this a little. We're not going to go, it's not just chapter one of the Bible I'm, I've split this into uh, 11 parts, and we're going to read it like, like we would a book with different chapters throughout. These chapters are just different themes that come out, and they're all tracing one thing, and we'll get to that in a, in a moment. So God creates man and woman on the sixth day and rests for the seventh day, and the difference when God finished creating humanity was that he said it wasn't just good. He said it's very good. This was the pinnacle of his creation because humans, men and women, men and women, <laughs> are created 
in the image of God himself. So cool. All right, so who is this man and woman? Well, we know them as Adam and Eve, and they're naked and unashamed, the Bible says, in the garden. And they live in perfect relationship with God. Now, the reason that's in there, naked and unashamed, it's not just talking about physical nakedness. It's talking about they are completely open. There's nothing to hide inside and out because there's no sin. There is no shame yet. They're in perfect relationship. I just love the idea of, of uh, the scripture saying like they were walking with, uh, with God in the garden, the garden of Eden in the evening, in the cool of the evening. I'm like, oh, that is such a cool picture. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. So you have this perfect relationship, and God gives them one rule. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's chapter one. Chapter two, which is actually in chapter three of Genesis. We have the fall, the curse, and the promise. So in Genesis chapter three, we are introduced to the antagonist of the story, the great antagonist. There's many antagonists. This is the great antagonist. You know, you guys know what an antagonist is? Nice. You guys have been to school. You guys have been to a school, I don't know, or through some school. All right, yes, the bad guy is introduced. The bad guy is introduced in the form of a serpent, but we know him throughout Scripture as Satan or the devil or the great deceiver, right? Satan actually just means accuser. And his first act is to deceive. So we're introduced to the antagonist, and his very first thing that he does is deceive Adam and Eve. And kind of goes, like, come on. Like, does God really say that? Because God told him not to eat from the tree. And they say, ah, I don't know. Here's, here's what he's doing. He's holding out on you guys. And so, by the way, this is still his tactics today, that we feel this, that God's holding out on us. And so Eve takes the bait and eats the fruit. Adam as well, who's standing there beside, him, beside her, I guess. I'm like, What? This is an interesting picture. It's like, is she going to eat that? <laughs> I guess so. Hmm, looks good. Let's eat it too. Not good. All right, and so what happens? Well, Adam and Eve, because of their sin, they must leave the Garden of Eden. What this shows is it shows the effects of sin that separates humankind from God. So what sin d- did is, is put a barrier between us and God. It broke that perfect relationship between humanity and this loving creator, God. And so because of sin, the earth falls under a curse. So you ever wonder why there's so much pain, so much suffering, so many things going wrong, so many weeds in my lawn? (laughs) It's because of the curse. When sin entered the world, it came with the curse. But God introduces his rescue mission to restore relationships. So we have the fall, we have the curse, and this is the promise. So in Genesis chapter 3, the third chapter of this book, so you can barely any pages in, what do we got? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So he's talking about to, to, to the devil, to, the, to Satan. And between your offspring and hers, he... This is singular, he. So he's talking about a specific person. Will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So what we have in play here, and you may have heard this and if you were listening to some Good Friday uh, sermons, that this is the first promise that God is going to, to get on this rescue mission. That he is not going to let sin win. He is not going to let the antagonist triumph. But he, he, someone must come, this he, this offspring of woman, so he'd be human. He will crush your head. And so this is what we see played out on Good Friday. He, the, the snake or the, um, Satan will bruise your heel. So we see, you know, if you've watched The Passion of the Christ or, or heard the story many times, you probably have. Um, you know, Jesus dying on the cross, the horrific death, that's the bruised heel. 
But what Jesus accomplished through his death was that he crushed the head of the snake. And so, yeah, he took the, he took the bite. But And we'll get, actually, that's, that's next week. I won't get too far into that. But this is the promise. So let's get into chapter three. Chapter three of this amazing story. We have Adam's descendants. So they, they multiply and fill the earth is what God told them, so they do. And they forget about God. Adam's descendants. So what happens is humanity forgets about God. And so in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, this is, this is what the Lord sees. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that, get this, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart. It's not talking about your beating heart. It's talking about the center of who you are, the center of your will. Every inclination. How many? How much? Okay, this is a huge statement, you guys. Every and this is everyone, right? Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil how much of the time? What? That's what God saw in humanity? By the way, we haven't changed. That's what he still sees. Every inclination of the heart, evil all the time. So what's he going to do? So God chooses a man named Noah to build an ark and tells him to invite Everybody say, hey, judgment's coming. You know, we've, we've been really wicked. <laughs> we've been some bad people. In fact, the, one of the, right after that in Genesis chapter 6, it, it talks about how much violence there was on the earth. And it just disturbed God. And so God chooses Noah. He builds an ark, tells him to build this big boat. Um, and there's lots of details that we can get into. We don't have time for um, But nobody says yes. Nobody gets on the ark. Nobody listens to Noah. So it's only Noah and his family, his sons and their wives and his wife, get on the boat. That's it. And God brings a flood and destroys the world. No one listens. And only Noah and his family are saved. Wow. Yeah, horrible, right? Well, we go, let's fast forward to chapter 4. God chooses to make a people for himself, the the promise. So this whole talk is called, part one is the promise. God chooses to make a people for himself. This was his plan right from the beginning, but this is where it starts to come. We find it in Genesis chapter 12. And he promises a guy named Abram, who you might know him as Abraham, God changed his name to Abraham, that he will bless all nations through him. Now this is pretty incredible because Abram, or Abraham, his wife is barren, which means she can't have kids. And so God's making this promise to Abraham. And Abraham's, Abraham's probably, uh, okay, <laughs> sounds good. But nothing happens for a really long time. But this is the promise. Eventually, Abraham would have a son. His name is Isaac, and we'll get to that in a minute. But this is God's promise. So now we have from Genesis 3, God promising that there'll be someone who comes. Now it's going to come through Abraham. It's going to be a blessing. So the same he that will crush the snake's head is the he that will bless all peoples. All right, let's go. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And here it is. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This, again, is talking about the light, talking about Jesus who would enter the world and would be a descendant of Abraham. So this is the promise of a Savior that would come. And he, for how many people? It says all people on earth. Right? That's why Christianity uh, isn't just the, for, for one race of people or one type of people. Christianity, is, it's meant for the whole world. It's all across the globe. You can be any, any color, any ethnicity, any whatever, and you can be a Christian. So cool. All right, so we, have, we go from, from the promise of chapter four to chapter five. We're talking about deliverance. Deliverance, uh-oh. Something bad's gonna happen again, right? So we have Abraham, whose son was Isaac, whose one of his sons was Jacob, 
And Jacob was renamed. You want to know where Israel came from? The nation of Israel was renamed Israel. Wrestles with God. Interesting story that we have to do another time. And so Jacob has 12 sons. One of them is sold as a slave by the brothers. These are great guys, obviously, right? Sold their little brother because <laughs> they're jealous of him to, to some, some dudes who were going to Egypt. His name is Joseph, by the way, the brother that got sold. So Joseph goes to jail in Egypt. And there's a massive story about Joseph. But eventually what happens with the other 11, they, of course, they lie to their dad, said, oh, he was killed by some wild animal, which probably happened lots in those days, right? Um, they didn't, I don't think they had... You know, I can't imagine fighting a lion with like a stone knife or something. <laughs> That'd be bad. Bad news. Lion probably won a lot. Uh, <laughs> so eventually what happens is famine comes into the land. Now Jacob's family's quite large at this time, and there's nothing to eat. And so they find out there's food in Egypt. And what's happened this whole time is that God has been with Joseph. And Joseph has gone from being a slave to getting thrown in false accused accused, thrown in jail, to rising up incredibly to second in command of the entire land of Egypt, but which, by the way, was the most powerful nation at this time, and now, because of the famine, would be the most powerful, because here's what Joseph did. Joseph, um, or God communicated to Joseph through a dream um, that there would be seven years of plenty, which means the crops would be awesome, farming would be like, woohoo. I should be a farmer uh, for seven years. But he said, I'm going to store all that grain. So I'm actually going to tax the people <laughs> of Egypt. There's lots of behind that. But, uh, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so Egypt had food. The rest of the world didn't. So everyone's going to Egypt for food. So Egypt becomes the most powerful nation on earth. And so what happens is Joseph has risen to the top, right? As high as you can go. You can't get any higher than second in command to Pharaoh unless you're Pharaoh himself. And you got to be, I'm pretty sure you got to be Egyptian to do that. And so um, Jacob's family, Israel, they go and end up living in Egypt, in a really nice fertile land, it says. And so uh, that's, so deliverance, where does deliverance come from? Oh, sorry, this is what Joseph says in uh, Genesis chapter 45. So we're still in Genesis. But God sent me ahead of you. So he's explaining to his brothers what happened, of course, when they find out he's the second in command in Egypt. It's like, oopsies, <laughs> this could go really bad. But it doesn't, because this is what Joseph said. God sent me ahead of you. Not you guys sold me into slavery. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So there's deliverance number one. So then, it was not you who sent me here. Odd statement, because they did. <laughs> but overall, he's talking about God's in control. But God, he made me father to Pharaoh. Interesting, right? Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. So Pharaoh just gave Joseph massive power. It's incredible. Um, okay, let's keep going. So time passes. And the great deeds of Joseph are forgotten. Another Pharaoh takes the throne, one who doesn't remember or even cares who Joseph was. And Israel has grown in number, and so this Pharaoh decides he will enslave these people, these foreigners. And so Israel becomes slaves for 400 years. Ouch. That's a long time. But God hears their cries. He sees their oppression, hears their cries, and he sends a deliverer. And his name is Moses. Well, Moses comes in. What do you think is going to happen? This Pharaoh, is Pharaoh going to give up his slaves easily? <laughs> no. And so Moses comes and does some things, tricks. <laughs> Not real tricks, but. <laughs> and the Pharaoh's like, ah, you don't impress me. At least it was tricks from Pharaoh's view. You don't impress me. You can't have my slaves. Are you kidding me? These guys are making me coin. And so what happens? Well, God brings plagues on Egypt. And not just kind of like, Moses goes, says, are you going to let my people go? Nope. Okay, here comes this plague. And it comes. And it happens over and over and over again until the final plague 
where it takes the firstborn of all the Egyptians, the firstborn male, even to their like livestock. And of course, Pharaoh, this is the crown prince. This is the next Pharaoh. And of course, they thought themselves, they thought they were deities at that time, right? Pharaoh thought he was God. (laughs) And his son, this one that he had put all his hope in, dies. And so he's had it. He's like, okay, take the people, get out of here. And so Moses takes the people, the Egyptians, eventually Pharaoh decides that that's a bad move because I did love my son, but I really love money. And so I want those slaves back. And he chases after them. There's this huge fiasco. The Israel is hemmed in on every side. The Red Sea's here, this cliffs, the Pharaoh's army's coming. What are they going to do? Well, you may have heard of this. Moses, uh, Moses doesn't. Actually, God does it through Moses. Parts the Red Sea. Israel goes through the Red Sea. On, this is dry land, so that's another miracle. And then Pharaoh comes up. He's like, wow, look at these water walls. This is incredible. It's a path right to the enemy. Let's go get them. They take off into the sea. And Israel's just got through. Moses gets up. That's it. Sea over the most powerful army on earth is wiped out like that. That's it. That's it for the Egyptian army and the Pharaoh. So where do the people go? Well, let's start chapter 6. Moses leads the people to a place called Sinai, Mount Sinai, where there's an incredible scene. And you may have heard this. God makes a covenant with his people and gives them the Ten Commandments. Uh, After that, gives them another 603. (laughs) So the 613 laws altogether in the first five chapters of, of the Bible. So, but it gives them the Ten Commandments. This is the, the moral law, we call it. And God promises the peop- that you people, I will be your God. You will be- this covenant's really significant. This is God announcing that you are my people. I'm not making a contract with you. I'm co- this is covenant. This is me and you. We're together. I'll be your God. You be my people. You be my witnesses in this, in this earth. He called them, I want you to be a nation of priests, is what he said. And what does a priest do? Well, a priest stands before, uh, between God and, and humans. That's what a priest does, mediates, right? In the Old Testament, that's what a priest does. And in fact, in the New Testament, it does too, but a priest isn't uh, someone who's wearing a collar, by the way. In the New Testament, a priest is someone who believes in Jesus. <laughs> so that's, again, for next week. Okay, we need to keep moving. Um, if you were betting that I wouldn't finish on time, you might be right, but we're already in chapter six. Let's go. So God promises the people, I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. It's called the promised land. Sounds good, but they send out spies to, to look at this promised land, and it's inhabited by ridiculously large and scary people. <laughs> and so out of the 12 spies that go, 10 of them come back and go like, mm, nope, we're like ants compared to those guys. They're huge. They got armor. They got chariots and horses and we're just a bunch of ragtag slaves. <laughs> we don't even know how to fight. And so they say, yeah, we can't go. Yeah, too bad God promised it because we can't do it. Except for two. Two spies go like, what are you guys talking about? Those guys aren't big. Because <laughs> it's all about perspective, right? So the ten were looking at themselves going like, we're just little and they're, they're big. The two were going like, looking up and going like, whoa, our God's huge. Look what he just did for us. These guys don't stand a chance. And what happens is the ten drown out the, the two. The people go with the ten. And so they kind of rebel and say, no, we're not going. And so God is upset, of course. Of course he's upset. I mean, he just made a covenant with them. There's other things that have happened between them. He's already had to forgive them a number of times. And that's it. He says, you're going to wander the desert for 40 years till this generation dies off. Next generation can go in. And the next generation does, led by a man named Joshua, who, by the way, was one of the two spies. Okay, so that's the covenant. Chapter 7, the line of David. Well, after the people take the land, they soon forget about God and again start to worship the gods of the nations around them. This is a big no-no. God, this is, uh, if you want to go in importance of commandments, (laughs) it's number one. 
And so they enter this cycle, and we see this in the book of Judges, actually right throughout the Bible. They enter the cycle of rebellion, oppression, and deliverance. And so what we have in the book of Judges, as well as First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, is this same cycle. The people rebel against God, say, we don't want you no more, anymore. God allows a foreign nation to come in, conquer them, and oppress them. They cry out, ah! And then, what does God do? He sends a deliverer, someone to deliver them. All of this played out, showing that light will push out darkness, that there will, all of these deliverers are all, even, and Moses as well, are pointing to another deliverance that is coming, a greater and bigger deliverance and deliverer is coming. All right. So we have this cycle of rebellion. Well, after a while, the people decide that we want to be like the other nations, which is the problem to begin with. We want to be like everyone else. Like, we're different, <laughs> which is like awesome. And they're like, we're different. Uh, we don't want to be different. We want to be like those guys. Um, and so they say, we want a king to rule over us. I'm not really understanding, of course, or maybe they did, that God was supposed to be their king, and, and if, especially with this covenant, and that if they, they fulfilled what God had asked them to do and, sit, and, and loved God and lived the lives that he'd asked them to live, then everything was, God's promises were amazing. If you read the Old Testament, the promises of God are incredible here for his people. If you just do this, but they, they wouldn't. We want a king. So ultimately what happens here is they reject God as the king. So what does God do? Okay. Right? Uh, I'll choose a king for you. So he chooses a guy named Saul. Saul is the first human king of Israel. But Saul rebels against God, disobeys him, doesn't want, nah, too bad. <laughs> I'm king now. And so God rejects Saul and chooses another king. And his name is David. Thus, chapter 7, the title, The Line of David. David is the youngest. He's the most unlikely candidate. He's the youngest son. So back in those days, oldest son was the candidate. He was the youngest son, so the opposite. And he's a shepherd. <laughs> right? He's just a boy. And he's chosen by God to be king. Amazing. God always seems to do the unexpected and choose the unlikely. That's a theme throughout scripture. And so God, so this is what God, so David has to wait till King Saul passes away. There's tons of stories in there. It's amazing. But God promises that David's throne will last forever. What a promise. And that the Messiah, which uh, for us, we, we say Christ. That's what Messiah, Christ. So Jesus Christ is Christ isn't his last name. It's who he is, right? He's the Messiah. Would come through David's line. So it's this coming king. The Messiah is a king that would come through the line of David. This is what uh, Samuel says in 2 Samuel. The Lord declares to you, he's talking to David, that the Lord himself will establish, establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. Now, there's some very interesting language here. It goes from your, ans or your ancestors and the people who come after your descendants. <laughs> um, he's going to raise up the offspring. But then it's singular. I will establish his kingdom. So there is another. There's the his again. So we have the promise in Genesis. We have the promise. We have, there was a promise to Noah as well. There's a promise to Abraham that there would be someone who is coming who would bless all the nations. And now we know that this person would, would come as a king. That's why we call him the Messiah. Your house and your kingdom will endure, endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. How can God say that? Because Jesus, when Jesus came, he was coming as the king. You see, he was a descendant of David. Cool, hey? All right, line of David. Chapter 8. Into the kings and prophets. Well, David's descendants, descendants did not do well. They did exactly like the people did before the kings. They reject God as well as the kings. And they return to the cycle of rebellion, oppression, deliverance. And so what does God do? He sends prophets. Prophets are people who have a message from God, right? 
So he sends these prophets to warn the people of coming judgment, to remind them of his goodness and love and his promises, and to turn away, to repent, to turn away from their wicked ways. And when you, when you look into the Bible at some of the, what the people were doing, it was awful, some of the things that they were doing. And so the kings and the people reject the prophet's words and kill them. <laughs> they mistreat the prophets terribly. They don't want to hear about it. But the prophets continue. So new prophets, not the ones that are already dead. <laughs> new ones. God chooses new ones. And those prophets continue to send out God's message, reminding them of the rescue mission and the promise of a Savior. Reminding them, just turn. Like Our God is gracious and kind. Just repent from all of these terrible things that you're doing. Come back to him. He's forgiving, gracious, and kind. So that's chapter 8, same, same cycle. Chapter 9, we've entitled Exile. Ah, it doesn't sound good, right? The story's taking another turn. Well, in the 8th century B.C., the northern kingdom, which, by the way, Israel split into two. So you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom falls in the 8th century to the Assyrians, who were just wicked, terrible people, and it's, it's an awful awful deal and then in the 6th century Judah falls to Babylon and ceases eventually ceased. after they fall they rebel again Nebuchadnezzar comes in who is the king of Babylon and just wipes, wipes not even a stone upon another stone says wipes out the city of Jerusalem so it's a sad day Right? People are taken by the Babylonians, which was their practice, to Babylon to make them into Babylonians. And so what happens during that time? Is it all over? Nope. See, God had promised that it would be a certain amount of time, and then the exile would be over. And so what happens? Well, during the 8th and 6th centuries, the prophets, the prophets, these messengers from God, they begin to become more specific about this Messiah, this person that would be coming in the line of David. And even this, this is one of the most incredible stories in all of Scripture. In Daniel, what we see in Daniel chapter 2, the wicked, evil king of Babylon, who has just forced his will over all of, all of the known world at the time and became the empire of Babylon. For no reason, for no good reason. He just wanted to take them over. Um has a dream, a dream that's given to him by God. He doesn't know what it is. Daniel comes in and tells him and, and realizes, oh, this is, this is God's deal here and tells him what the dream means. So you can actually read that if you want to in Daniel chapter two. And the message of the dream is this, that there's a new kingdom coming and it's not gonna be like the other kingdoms. It's, going to be, it's actually going to crush every other kingdom. And it's never going to end. It will be a forever kingdom. So that's introduced. So this new kind of kingdom, never heard about this before, but it's given to a, this terrible king. And it's in the book of Daniel. Daniel's, yeah, you can read that. So here's some other, uh, here's some other really specific things that were prophesied in the, in the seventh or the 8th and 6th centuries by prophets. There's a ton of them. But these are specifically about this one, this rescue mission. So in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And if, so if you're going pro, to predict something's going to happen, you probably are not going to predict this. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Remember at the start we said God's wanting to be with his people. He wants, what? God with us? That's the name of this baby, this son? Born of a virgin? That's impossible, right? Nobody predicts that. This, by the way, this is over 700 years before the birth of Jesus, this was written. That a virgin would conceive, <laughs> right? An impossibility, unless God's the father. Huh. Because he had to be human, right? 
Ah, oh, right? His king, all these his is that we're in here. This is a person. This is a human being that's coming. But he can't just be human now. Oh, that's how it's going to happen. Here's another one. This is, uh, uh, this one is about, I think Micah is a 6th century prophet, so at least, anyway, if he's 8th or which, whichever, it's a long time before Jesus' birth, hundreds of years. Even names the place where Jesus would be born. But you, Beth, Bethlehem or Pathetha, <laughs> did I say that? Through you are small among, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will bear, who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Right? It's talking about Jesus again. So there's just like, there's so many. There's actually over 300 specific prophecies about Jesus written in the Bible long before Jesus' birth. It's, it's incredible. So that's exile. We need, we need to cruise. Chapter 10, we're almost there. Silence. Oh, no. Another bad one. Exile and then silence? <gasps> What's going on? Bad stuff's going to happen? Yeah, maybe. It all starts out good. So the exile finishes. Judah gets to come back and is restored. They build the city of Jerusalem. They rebuild the temple. It seems like everything is good. And then for the next, oh, I don't know how many hundreds of years, <laughs> the same thing happens. The, the, the nation of Israel, or the nation of Judah gets overrun and overtaken by one world power after another. And here's where the silence comes in. The prophets are no longer coming. And there's 400 years of silence. 400. No new messages from God. Well, during this 400 years, went from different empire to different empire, and then comes the Roman Empire. And Rome takes over Jerusalem, and Roman occupation, pay, uh, Roman occupation starts, but it paves the way for the moment God has chosen from Genesis chapter 3, the moment that God has chosen to enter history as one of his created beings. You see... Rome conquered the known world, and so there was kind of a relative peace at the time, and it was the perfect setting for this Messiah, this one who would crush the snake's head, this one in the line of David, this one who would be a descendant of Abraham who would bless all peoples would come. And so we hit chapter 11, and we're only going to, Introduce chapter 11. The promise fulfilled. Jesus, a descendant of David, is born in a cave in a tiny town to a poor couple, more specifically to a virgin named Mary. And an adopted father, adoptive father named Joseph. God became human. What? And not just a man. He didn't just appear as a man. A helpless baby. Wow. That, that should just blow us away. What in the world? And we're going to figure out just why that's so important next week. You see, the light has come into the world and the darkness cannot overcome it. So all of the sin, the curse, all of those things are darkness. The serpent, the sa Satan. It's all about darkness. God's sending the light and it's going to push back the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. So that's where we're going to pause in our story. We're going to pick it up next week. Here's what I want you to take away, just one thing. The stories and characters in the Bible are not for us to point a finger at and laugh or go like, what in the world are they doing? I wouldn't do that. No. Stories are in there because they are a mirror in which we are meant to see ourselves. The same cycles of rebellion, oppression, and repentance are still happening. Deliverance, sorry. 
Repentance is the next stage for us. Still happening today. Still the same cycle. That is why it's a rescue mission. That God had to become human to pull us out of this cycle. To pull humanity, not just individuals, humanity out of the cycle. To give them an opportunity to restore the relationship with God that was broken in the garden. They are a mirror in which we are meant to see ourselves. See, we're in those stories. All those stories. That's us. We like to put ourselves as the hero. (laughs) The Daniel or the whatever. We're not the hero. God's the hero. We put ourselves in the wrong place when we read these stories if we're putting ourselves as the hero. It's a mirror where we see ourselves and we see what God saw in Genesis chapter 6. That everywhere, everything, every inclination of the heart was evil all the time. That's what the mirror shows and it shows that we need to be rescued. There has to be a rescuer. We're going to talk about him next week to be continued. All right, so that's uh, the first half of the story. It's not too bad. uh, (laughs) Definitely went a little over time, so you all won the the bet. (laughs) I'll I'll tell tell you what. This is what I owe you. Another sermon next week. Ah, part two. (laughs) Didn't see that one coming, did you? (laughs) All right, so I hope you guys enjoy that story. It's a true story. It's a real story. It is the story of Scripture. The story of God and humans. The story of God and his creation. And we're going to continue it next week. All right, we're going to go to small groups. There's questions there at the back. I'm I'm just going to pray for you guys as we go. Um, I just think there's power in this story. It's a powerful story. In fact, every like epic story that you read or hear in in novels or or see on in in movies fall, they have to have these themes. The themes that are found in scripture is what gives us the great stories. Redemption, struggle, deliverance. Uh, I need to stop. I'm just excited about that. So let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, thank you for these students and these leaders. They are amazing people. I love them all. They are incredible. Um, Lord, they are created in your image. It's amazing. And Lord, you are, uh, you are very pleased with your work. <laughs> You've created some amazing students and leaders here. Father, uh, I just pray you'd be with us as we go to discussion in our groups. Um, Yeah, Lord, I I pray that at some point in each group that there would just be an opportunity to marvel about who you are, what you've done. It's incredible. Thank you for this great story that you've given us. And Lord, I, I just pray you'd just put the hunger in our hearts for more to fill out the story. This is just the broad overview, the big story underneath. But all those individual stories are important. And so, Lord, uh, I pray you put a hunger in all of us we want, we want more of you. We want to know you more. We want, to, we want to see ourselves better with this mirror that's reflecting who we really are. Help us to do that. And I just pray a blessing over all these students. Father, they are awesome. We love them. You desire relationship with them. And I'm just super stoked about that. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.